Let me start by thanking you all uh, for being here in this breakout room. I'm uh, Dr. Sharon Milgram, and I direct the NIH Office of Intramural Training and Education. So I uh, work with NIH intramural uh, trainees, but many of our programs are uh, open to trainees of fellows outside of NIH and feel free to check our website, which is uh, www.training.nih.gov. Let me just start by sending my heartfelt hopes to all of you with family uh, who are in the Middle East, uh, that they are safe and that you're able to make contact um, with them and provide some support, albeit at a distance. We are certainly um, uh, witnessing uh, some really uh, difficult uh, things in the news. And I think it's important we're whole people and it's important for us to pause and reflect on what's going on around us. I'm going to talk today on boundaries and well-being and balance and purpose uh, and how that all comes together uh, for each of us as an individual as we define our path in our life and our work. I, in general, am not a big fan of the idea of uh of, of work-life balance or the phrase work-life balance, because I think it puts us in a really difficult position of imagining that it's always going to be balanced just the way we want it to be. I think the question is more about work-life integration and flexibility, how we set boundaries and how we decide through an exploration of our purposes in life when we want to focus our attention on things at work and when we want to focus our attention on other things that matter uh, to us. And so I'm going to take you through a bit of a discussion and hopefully we'll have time uh, at the end for some Q&A and back and forth. And let me just provide this visual framework for our discussion today. You know, I, I view my life and my work as sort of a series of um, events where I'm trying to move from A to B. Sometimes that can be over a very long period of time, sometimes very short project. And, you know, sometimes it's just like this beautiful bridge at the bottom here, right? It feels smooth and easy. I might even pause in the middle and savor the beauty, look at the ducks in the water, and it just feels like this nice, easy bridge. But sometimes I experience things and it feels a bit more like this bridge, wobbling and shaking and I'm really nervous and the water underneath seems treacherous. It's probably really cold and I am navigating this really difficult experience. And sometimes it feels like there's actually no bridge at all. And I'm just jumping from slippery stone to slippery stone. Now, I think some people grow up uh, spending a lot of time in nature, skipping across, uh, you know, rivers. But certainly that's not been my experience. And I always freeze at the start of something like that and wonder, will I be able to jump and land and make it? And I think we go through life with a whole lot of experiences, some of which are on this beautiful bridge, some are on this shaky bridge, and with some, there's no bridge at all. And the honest truth is we all need to be prepared for all of these scenarios. And there is really important learning to be found when we're skipping the rocks and when we're on the wobbly bridge. There can be really important learning, but we have to be intentional and curious. We need support and we need a lot of time and practice for navigating these times when we feel really unsupported, when we feel that we are really having to make some uh, difficult decisions. Now, a key concept in this model is that sometimes people reach out a hand and we tend sometimes not to want to grab it right? There's a lot of feeling of I need to navigate this myself as a trainee in science. I'm supposed to know how to do this, but grabbing the hand that reaches out is a good thing. Another thing is 
that reaching out to help others. So putting your hand out when somebody is navigating a difficult situation, that is also a good thing. But both come with caveats. We need to find a good support system as we're navigating challenges and deciding about steps we're gonna take within our work and our life. So we need to make sure that the hands that are reaching out are hands that support us. And on the flip side, some of us are so busy helping others that we're not necessarily taking care of ourselves. So there are caveats. To make these challenging decisions, to get through these challenging moments, we all need three things. Inner resource, right? The ability to stay calm, to focus, to make decisions, to decide how we want to set boundaries, where we want to put our energy. So we need inner resource. We need external support, a community of mentors and peers who nurture us. And we need some honest discussions of why we face barriers in this regard. The honest truth is that the culture of science can be a barrier in and of itself, right? There are very high expectations. We're always worried about being evaluated. It's a very hierarchical environment. But we also have internal barriers, our beliefs around work and life, our beliefs about uh, what is happening to us, where we have power and agency, and where we don't. So they are, those are three really important concepts. A lot of times when we talk about integrating our work in our life or finding balance, we offer some tips and tricks, do this or do that, schedule time away, etc. And I think all of that is really uh, can be very helpful. But today, what I want to do is step back and say, that the first principle of establishing balance in our life is the ability to set boundaries. And the first principle of our ability to set boundaries is that we believe we have the agency to do that and we take care of our health and well being. We will not thrive at work and in life. We will not make the challenging decisions we need to make until we do it from a place of well being. And we're scientists, we understand data, and we know a lot about protective factors for mental health and well being. And one is learning and using positive coping strategies. Another is finding connection and support. We've talked a little bit about that already. A third is actually getting away, taking time to develop hobbies, to be with loved ones, to rest and to recharge. And a lot of us struggle with that because we have substantial amounts of guilt about it or concern about being judged. But the honest truth is that this is one of the key takeaway messages of the literature on health and well being is time away is value added when you return. Another important protective factor is a sense of financial stability. And I won't talk a lot about that today, but there are. Um, you know, really important things that we can do as a research community to support people through loan repayment applications, uh, making sure that we do our best to carefully look at compensation and such. Without a doubt, uh, there are things we can do, although some of that is policy out of our control. I want to talk a little bit about positive coping strategies because we won't find balance in our work and life until we develop uh, our resilience, and we learn and appreciate the principles of positive psychology. Deciding whether to work or shut off work and spend time doing something we love requires us to pause and calmly look at where things are at. It requires us to put into perspective the stories we are telling ourselves about having some balance, and that is learned through uh, practice through education, right? And it can't be done without the two of those. We also need to understand the stress continuum. There's a good kind of stress or what's called in the literature, use stress. It drives us to focus, right? Before a meeting, when we're getting ready, if we're excited and we feel this is within our capacity, 
we can be really stressed in a good way. It makes us practice. It makes us proofread one more time. It makes us say, what might they ask me that will be challenging? But you stress can quickly uh, tip into distress where we feel that we cannot cope, where the stress leads to burnout and health and mental health issues. So we have to understand our stress response. We have to understand our warning signs for distress. Another thing about positive coping strategies is we have to understand why some things are hard for us. And that means examining the messages that we've gotten both from science and broader culture about work and uh, finding balance in our lives. And it also means softening some of the myths that can get in the way, right? I often hear people uh, say they really want to take time away, but you know they won't get a good letter of recommendation if they take leave, right? Is that true? Is that a myth? Publish or perish is a difficult phrase that we hear a lot in science. Well, yes, publications matter, but does that mean that we can't pause, have balance, uh, set uh, our work and life activities in a little bit more of an equal way? So not to say that we always can find a way to balance, but to imply that as we learn to examine why this is hard, we also see clear ways through. Now, academic and research culture is most certainly a barrier to us finding balance, to us feeling well, because we get a message uh, to work all the time, right? There's a lot of pride when you come in on the weekend, oh, what did you do? Oh, I worked, I worked on this grant, I wrote, I uh, reviewed papers. There's a lot of uh, a lot of pressure on people uh, to work. It's very hierarchical this culture, and there's worries about uh, letters of recommendation. People talk about I don't want to burn a bridge, even when the relationship isn't good. We worry about that. There's a lot of cultural messaging that we receive as scientists. In fact, I think that the whole notion of purpose might play into this in a difficult way for all of us. So it's really important to know what your purpose is in life. The problem is it's not just one purpose, it's many purposes. And we tend to focus on that through the lens of work and we get enmeshed in our work and we define ourselves by our work. And that can really lead us uh, to setting unhealthy boundaries. And so I think it's important to pause and ask, what are the messages that you have heard that keep you from taking time away, that make you feel that it's impossible to take time away? Some other things to think about when we talk about learning positive coping strategies is that we're all unique and different. We've all had different prior experiences. We all have different identities. And so the way I cope is different than the way you will cope, which is different than the way your colleague will cope. So we can all learn the same strategies and then we have to make them work for us. We have to personalize them. Some things will work uh, better. Some things won't work as well and we'll have to practice it a little bit more. Any trainee or staff member who has spent time in a research group that has a toxic or unsupportive environment struggles with messages learned in that environment. And sometimes we have to unlearn unhealthy messages to make a way forward. Now, people like to go to workshops right? And, and get information on all of this. But the honest truth is that workshops in the absence of real sustained effort, both personally and institutionally, won't move the needle. This is the kind of material we need to hear, think about, talk about, work on, make change. It's like iterative learning. We try to set boundaries and have some balance. We evaluate how we're doing. We evaluate the guilty feelings that might have come along with it. How did we handle that? And we learn for the next time. 
We find ourselves on that shaky, really difficult bridge. What did we do that was helpful? What did we do that wasn't helpful? So it's not a matter of a workshop. It's really a matter of embracing the concepts of well-being and boundary setting and resilience, which all really go together. We teach a program at NIH called Becoming a Resilient Scientist. It's a five-part series, and it's based on this model that can be very, very helpful. What we think affects how we feel and act. How we feel affects what we think and do. And what we do affects how we think and feel. They are all intertwined, and changes in one will impact the other two. And there are some things to ask yourself two questions, right? And we'll just think about thoughts for a moment, but we really can apply this to behaviors as well. Is this helpful or unhelpful? If I realize that I really need a break and time with family, and I decide to push on anyway, because I'm telling myself a story that others will judge me, I need to ask myself, is that helpful or unhelpful? Is that an accurate story? Could it be softened? When it comes to behaviors, right, we think we'll take a break after the next deadline and the next deadline and the next deadline. Are the hours I'm working right now helpful or unhelpful? Because sometimes we work hard, but not smart. And if we could pause and appreciate that, it might be easier to take a break, reset, have some time away and then come back much more refreshed. Now we tend to focus on the thoughts and behavior part of this, but the honest truth is we are driven by emotions, whether we realize them or not, right? And there's a lot of discomfort and frustration that comes along with a lot of the decisions that we need to make. I don't think we should think of emotions as helpful or unhelpful. I like to think of them as comfortable or uncomfortable. So maybe I need to have an uncomfortable decision with my PI about an upcoming vacation, but I really need that time away and I really need to recharge, reconnect, see family I haven't seen in a while. That conversation brings up uncomfortable feelings, right? And fear and it can be really challenging. And so I think it's important to acknowledge uncomfortable feelings so we can pause and spend some time thinking about what they mean. None of this comes easy, but without a doubt, people tend to focus first on the stories that they're telling themselves with an effort to try to soften them. The other thing that people will often start with is trying some positive behaviors to drive resilience. And I'm gonna give you a couple of those at the end. Those two seem to be easier entrees into this material for trainees. The Becoming a Resilient Scientist series is going on now. We are actually at unit three, but you can catch it all on the NIH OITE YouTube channel. I have a link at the end. If you notice, the first two units here really do focus on that triangle of thoughts and feelings uh, and behaviors. But then we move into some things you might not think of as really a part of resilience, like advocating for yourself, being assertive and setting boundaries. So much of balancing or integrating your work and life is setting boundaries and advocating uh, to hold on to those boundaries. It's about developing ability to have challenging conversations as you advocate for yourself. And it's a lot about managing mentoring relationships and finding a community of mentors. We've done a lot of in-depth evaluation of this course, and it shows benefits to trainees at many, many educational levels, including people who are transitioning uh, into work environments. Now, as we think about this material, I think it's important to look at what comes first, right? So do we set boundaries so that we can be well and have balance? Do we find our purpose and then decide, well, what boundaries are helpful for that? Like, where do we start? And the honest truth is that I don't think any of us will find a sense of balance, not to say always, but often enough, 
until we take care of ourselves and learn about setting boundaries. Now, a big part of all of this is trying to put together how our work relates to our broader purposes that we see. Sometimes that takes a long time to sort out. Sometimes we see a little micro purpose, right? And we're not focusing on the big purpose, but I think it's really important for us to appreciate how intertwined these are. So I'm not sure any of them come first, but without a doubt, one of the first principles is to do well, we have to be well. And so I think well-being and boundary setting are probably the two to think about at the outset. A lot gets in our way of setting boundaries and a lot gets in our way of taking care of ourselves better. And it's worth really reflecting on what are the barriers for us? What are the general barriers in our communities? But what are the unique barriers for us? I also want to reflect on the idea of whether there really is such a thing as balance. So I spend time working out uh, in the morning uh, in a small group. Most of the people in the group are, we're hitting those later decades of life where we start to be concerned a lot about mobility and balance. And I've come to realize that, yes, I have to exercise regularly to maintain my balance. But one of the bigger questions in the long term is, what happens when I'm knocked off balance? How do I right myself? So maybe we have to acknowledge that balance isn't out there, but our ability to do the best that we can in the moment, to juggle all the priorities in our life, to set ourselves up for success by getting time away, that that's the best we can do. And then we focus on that rather than looking for some perfection that doesn't exist. I think that it's important to think about what we can learn about balance from thinking about physical balance. And it's the two things I mentioned. We have to practice. If we want to have balance, it takes regular attention. And we have to have ways to catch ourselves and protect ourselves when we get out of balance. Another thing to think about is in this whole realm of purpose, is that static or dynamic? Does it change over time? And how do we note that change? <laughs> and really important to appreciate that it's really many things. It's not that we have one purpose. We might have one purpose that really drives us at work. But if we want to be balanced individuals, we want to think about other purposes. And I think one last thing, as we put all of this together, so many trainees tell me that they don't have time for well-being. They don't have time to learn a lot of these skills because if they don't accomplish what they want to accomplish at work, then, you know, their purpose hasn't been met. I think it's important to look for our purpose, but I think we need to ask ourselves, is it so important that we should put our health on the line? our relationships on the line. Job burnout is a big issue and a very unique form of work-related stress. It's characterized by a state of chronic emotional and physical exhaustion, a feeling of disconnection where we sort of are depersonalized from the people we work with, but also the patients we serve or the stakeholders that we serve. And it comes with this diminished sense of personal accomplishment and a negative sense of self-value. Job burnout is often uh, a consequence of not finding healthy boundaries between our work and our life. It involves behavioral and emotional signs. The thing is, they can be very common. They can be very easy to dismiss because they are so common. And it's easy to attribute them to other causes. It's really important as we notice the signs of burnout in ourselves to really make sure that we talk with trusted supporters. There is a lot of work on burnout done by Dr. Maslach. He actually published uh, the Maslach Burnout Inventory, which you can all take a look at. But just summarizing that a little bit, think about yourself. Think about people around you. Here are some possible signs of burnout. Being late, 
canceling appointments, being more critical of others. You notice yourself suddenly more sarcastic about work. You're making more mistakes, withdrawing from group activities, emotional outbursts with colleagues and students. Uh, can really be a part of burnout, right? As we notice ourselves having less ability to manage our uncomfortable emotions. And there are emotional changes, apathy, frustration, irritability, you feel hopeless. I think you really get caught feeling like you're constantly on that wobbly bridge or constantly navigating really challenging situations without even any good stones to step across. There can be self-doubt and increased imposter fears that go along with burnout as well. Burnout is a really pervasive issue in high knowledge environments. And so we all need to learn first what burnout looks like for us. For each of us, it's different. I find journaling can be helpful. Sometimes you wanna find folks that you trust, trusted mentors, healthcare providers, therapists, uh, if you're in a relationship with a counselor, and really explore what burnout looks like for you. It's good to check in with yourself regularly, especially if you note some decreased enthusiasm for work that you once cared about and loved. I will show you my burnout strategy in a moment. You need to figure out one for you. Preventing burnout brings us back to boundaries and balance. Right? Because we will not prevent burnout if we are constantly, constantly pushing ourselves. If we constantly make decisions that work comes first, eventually we will lead uh, to a burnout situation. And I know some people say, well, look at the successful scientists around us who've done it. But honestly, the model isn't working. There's a lot of toxic research environments absent mentors, difficult mentoring relationships. There's six-fold rates, higher rates of anxiety and depression in PhD students uh, than the match population. So I think we need to look at the model and ask if it's working. This is what I use to check in on myself to make sure that I have enough balance and that I'm setting healthy boundaries. It starts on Sunday. You know, how do I feel when I think about going to work on Monday? And I do that most of the time. I did it yesterday uh, because um, although um, I worked a little bit, yesterday was really a holiday. Even better is to add, how do I feel on Friday? So I'll sit on my way out and reflect back on the week. It gives me a chance to reflect back and, and think about being proactive. So sometimes I realize it's been a rough time and boundaries have been difficult in the moment and my balance around work and life hasn't been exactly what I want. It lets me ask for help, whether that's talking with my boss or talking with someone at home. Sometimes I'll tell my wife, I'm gonna need a little bit of extra help with the cooking. I do a lot of the cooking for our family, you know, and sometimes I just need some help. It can allow us to rearrange work and or personal responsibilities and activities. We need to be cautious that it's not always work first, personal things uh, put aside. But if we realize at the end of the week, it's been a struggle, we can start to rearrange some. Sometimes it just helps us realize we need to explain what is going on to people uh, who need to know. It also is a chance to reflect more deeply on longer term trends. Am I really losing sight of the need to set balance? Am I really, uh, re am I really caught up in work in an accurate way or are the stories I'm telling myself driving over work and inefficient work? And I said this before, to do well, we have to be well. If we want to set uh, boundaries, uh, it's it's really a part of, of dealing with this broader issue of being well. It's a chicken and egg, because I don't think we can set boundaries till we begin taking care of ourselves and valuing taking care of ourselves. Then we can set boundaries, and then we can find more balance, but we have to find a way to break in. I sometimes think about this. People say, oh, it's really selfish to take care of myself. So I'd like to frame it another way. To treat others well, we have to be well ourselves. 
So when we take care of ourselves, we contribute to a healthier research and healthcare community. So we take it a little bit from a different perspective. There are many dimensions of well-being, and some of them, the literature will actually define seven different dimensions. If you want to explore the OITE model for well-being, you can watch Becoming a Resilient Scientist Unit 1 on our YouTube channel. To be well, you have to take care of your body, your mind, your heart, and in this case, I mean your emotional well-being and your spirit. For some, spiritual well-being comes from religious institutions. For many, it comes uh, from other areas as well, and it doesn't come from religious institutions. A bit of finding our purpose is tapping into that spiritual part of ourselves. To do all of this means to be in a work environment that helps us do this and to feel some sense of psychological safety. Psychological safety is the belief that you won't be punished or humiliated when you ask for time away, when you speak up with ideas, when you advocate for yourself, when you disagree with someone. Psychological safety doesn't actually mean people always get along and are always nice. It means that we define healthy ways of engaging with each other and supporting each other. And again, I think there's an, a little bit of an element of, of uh, where do we break in here? Because if you're in an environment that doesn't feel safe, it's really hard to find ways to take care of yourself. But you need to find ways to take care of yourself to uh, do something about the environment. And that's why I think this is all so hard. And there aren't lists of top 10 strategies for, you know, boundaries, top 10 strategies uh, for taking, um, you know, self-advocate, uh, advocating for yourself. So I just want to give you a moment to reflect not only on your personal well-being, as I mentioned earlier, but your workplace well-being. Do you work in an environment that helps you feel safe? Do you have support to know your strengths, your developmental needs? Do you have access to critical resources with few barriers? If you do and you don't use them, you have to ask yourself why. And that's where you want to pause and do the work. Do you feel a part of important communities? Do you have opportunities to contribute in meaningful ways? Do you feel seen and heard as the diverse and multifaceted person you are? Do you get to drive the agenda at least some of the time? Most of us have a boss, and at times the boss drives the agenda. But can we nudge that agenda? Can we move it pretty substantially uh, with discussion? Are you given time to develop your resilience, your response to setback and disappointment? Do you know your values and how your values play a role uh, in how you behave at work? Do people appreciate and support you in pursuing your longer term goals? And do people help you find ways to take time to take care of yourself and your life? Not Maybe not all of the time, but much of the time, not just after a deadline or in the face of a crisis. That's work-life flexibility that we've been talking about uh, as we've moved through the material. So there is an element of you looking at you and how you're doing, and then you need to look at you within your workplace environment. Now, there's really two elements to this. One is changing the way we look at new opportunities so we find a place that puts a focus on workplace well-being. So when we're looking for positions, Yes, we factor in science and the work that we're going to do, but we also factor in the culture, the environment. Will uh, Does everyone work to build a community that supports each other? So that's one part of this. The other part of it is what if you find yourself in an environment that does not promote adequately psychological safety for you at the moment? or ever, and then you really need to find supporters and talk about it. What can you do to take as good care of yourself as you possibly can? When we do that, 
we avoid burnout and we realize our resilience or we find ways to navigate the hard challenges. So number one, we tend to our well-being, right? So we go back to the first principles of taking care of our body, our heart, our mind, and our spirit. We look at what barriers we have. We make small changes at the outset. If we try to change everything, we get overwhelmed. So we make some small changes at the outset with the hope that they lead to bigger and bigger changes. We also need to look carefully at our relationship to work. Many, many high knowledge workers can become very enmeshed with our work, meaning we define ourselves solely through our work. One of the reasons why it is so hard to set boundaries between our work and our lives is that we define ourselves through our work. That's the risk of purpose because purpose can often drive work. That can be helpful at times, but unhelpful at times. So we need to define our broader purposes so that we don't become so connected with ourselves as work. This is really uh, a challenge. When boundaries are blurred, we tend to give up all the things we love outside of work. And the reason why enmeshment is such a challenge is because if we define ourselves only through our work, when we fail at work, we are a failure. If we suddenly hate our work, we hate ourselves. And let's be honest, sometimes we wake up and it doesn't feel so uh, energizing to go in. And maybe hate's a strong word, but I think sometimes I, I would have to say it, it, it really does feel like a challenge to stay focused at work. If we lose an aspect of our work, we lose a part of ourself. And that's a really risky set of occurrences. So burnout and enmeshment make it very, very hard to set boundaries. When we set boundaries and find balance, we decrease the risk of burnout and enmeshment. I think the best four questions to assess whether we're too connected to work are these four. How much time do you think about work outside of work? Is it hard to carry on conversations with others that are not about work? Do you have hobbies outside of work that are not associated with work? And can you focus on them freely and with joy? And do you hide it when you take time to unplug and get away? Are you ashamed of leaving work and taking time? So those are the first two things. The third thing is we start to think about the barriers that are getting in our way. And some of them are perfectionism, guilt and shame we can really lack compassion for ourselves. Many of us have gotten a message to push ourselves, right? But the honest truth is the science of positive psychology and the science of self-compassion shows us when we can accept our challenges and our flaws, we do much better with them. Sometimes a fear of what others will think of us gets in the way, especially in hierarchical environments, a desire to be liked and or admired can get in the way of setting boundaries. And many of us have learned unhelpful beliefs around assertiveness, and we have not been given the tools or the safe places to practice, especially because we work in very hierarchical environments. So the way we avoid burnout and we build our resilience is by paying attention to all of these uh, issues. Some ways of cultivating well-being and balance, there are many well-known proven strategies, journaling and mindfulness, whether you meditate or practice other elements of mindfulness, uh, like yoga, tai chi, you can take a mindful walk. You can pause in the middle of the day to just reflect mindfully. Self-compassion, support groups, counseling, right? And, and generally taking care of ourselves. Exercise and sleep are really almost first principles for the rest of this. Our brains are hardwired to see the negative. That is a survival mechanism and how we evolved. So we actually have to train our brain to think more positively. There's an exercise, three good things, where we focus on the positive, even when we're facing a struggle, 
there is a huge science of practicing gratitude and journaling about positive experiences, not to ignore the realities of what we're facing and the challenges and the hard decisions, but to put them in perspective. Our thoughts drive our behaviors and have a really dramatic interplay with our emotions. When we tell ourselves imposter fear stories, when we tell ourselves catastrophizing stories, it drives all kinds of unhelpful behaviors. I can't take off because I have to get this work done. If I don't, my PI won't be happy. I won't get a letter. I won't get a job, right? And, and the story just grows. So we really need to train ourselves to recognize those unhelpful stories helpful or unhelpful questioning, reframing strategies. I find just using mindful pauses to think, what am I telling myself? One thing I like to tell myself is the rule of opposites. When I think I should hide, I need to reach out. We had a very, very difficult weekend in our house, some family things. I have a lot of family in the Middle East, and I'm trying to wrap myself around what's happening there. I have not, I was not and have not been my best. And I just kept saying, I don't want to talk to anyone about it. I'm just going to work. I'm just going to work. I'm just going to organize the house. But the honest truth is that feeling of, I want to be left alone, the rule of opposite. I need to connect with someone. And I did. And I talked and you know what? Nothing is that easier but everything feels a little bit more within my coping strategies. One last thing to really remind you of what you love is something we call a wellness collage. I'll share with you mine. Go through your phone, pull out some pictures that you love that make you feel you. And here I am cooking and with friends. This is my wife and son. Tennis and sports and art and nature, etc make a wellness collage and remind yourself of what makes you feel good and what helps you find balance. We have a YouTube channel with a lot of resources and there are many, many activities that we offer that are open to people outside the NIH. I'm very happy to take uh, questions uh, if you have uh, any comments, uh, anything and just feel free uh, to use the chat. I hope this was helpful. I know that uh, putting this all together um, is, um, is a challenge. You know, there's a comment about, I wish I had heard this talk uh, when I was a student, so do I. I wish I had learned this material long ago. As a PI, I think about unfortunate decisions that I made that impacted people in my group. I think of unfortunate decisions and things I lost out on uh, in my life. That said, now I understand the material and I still find it hard. So all of us need to really put some time and energy uh, into this. There is a uh, a private message about imposter fears and how hard it can be to deal with imposter fears uh, and that that really gets in the way because you're so worried about what people think about you. You know, I, I, I have to say that I think as a community, Senior leadership dumps a lot of imposter fears on our trainees and people that we mentor, sometimes really inadvertently. I think there's so much message about striving and accomplishing, and all of that is important, but it's really, really hard uh, to hear that message and then make mistakes. And let's be honest, we're all going to make mistakes or to not know something or to find something really difficult. And so I think that as a community, A, we need to appreciate that imposter fears are a struggle for many. Probably 70% or more is what the literature suggests. B, imposter fears can be dumped on you uh, from others. 
That is especially true if you work in a uh, absent mentoring environment or an uncomfortable, unsupportive mentoring environment. I also think it's important to appreciate that people of color, people that bring other differences in the workspace, whether hidden or uh, uh, easily uh, noted, I think imposter fears are a bigger challenge because the message of not belonging feeds in with the messages that bubble up internally. So I think it's incredibly important to spend a lot of time talking about imposter fears. Unit two of the Resilient Scientist series is um, focused a lot on uh, imposter fears. There are a lot of programs at NIH focused on them. We welcome trainees to many of our environments.